Cahirlach, uh, let me first of all begin uh, by welcoming uh, Liam Shannon uh, to the Shannon uh, here today. Uh, Liam, Sh Liam is here on behalf uh, of the group who are known as the Hooded Men. The men, 14 in all, are so known because they were selected by the British and Unionist governments for special attention. They were separated out, isolated from several hundred other men who, like them, were arrested in swoops in the days and weeks after internment was introduced in the North in August 1971. That special attention led to these 14 men experiencing a horrendous time at a secret location which we now know to be Bally Kelly Army Barracks, tortured by highly trained members of the British Crown Forces, who, despite the passage of time, almost 50 years, uh, remain unknown to these 14 men. Their identity remains protected by the British Government, on whose behalf they practised their nefarious deeds on the men, defenceless and in captivity. For nearly 50 years, these men have been on a mission for truth and justice for themselves, their families and for humanity itself. Four of the 14 men have died during this time, and our solidarity and support is with their families today. The remainder continue in their quest for justice. And it's a quest that began in August 1971, in dark, despairing and, da and a dangerous dungeon, where these men individually and separately were hooded and handcuffed to a radiator and systematically and ruthlessly interrogated beyond the point of exhaustion over a seven to ten day period. These vulnerable men were cruelly and grievously injured physically and psychologically by their captors. The full resources of the British state were used to try to crush the will of these 14 men. They were guinea pigs in a torture experiment which the British government had used in other colonies and on other defenceless and captured prisoners. The methods deployed on Irish citizens are still followed to this very day the ABCs of torture carried out throughout the world still. The toolkit of the torturer was multi-layered. The first and most essential part of the torturer's toolkit was the knowledge that, he was doing, that what he was doing had the approval of the British and Unionist governments and that he had immunity from prosecution or accountability for his cruel behaviour. The second part was the knowledge that the torturer was trained in his dark arts by the British Ministry of Defence and was well paid for his services. The toolkit also included the torturer's manual, the infamous five techniques. When combined, these techniques sub subjected the men to, to so-called deep interrogation. These techniques were meticulously refined to have maximum impact on the helpless individual being experimented on. But for the techniques to work, to, for the techniques to work effectively, the men had to be in a state of fear and uncertainty. They were violently arrested from their homes by the British Crown Forces. They were taken by helicopter, hooded to an unknown destination, where silence and isolation reigned. They were stripped of their clothes and personal belongings and forced to wear a boiler suit and hood. As Francie McGuigan told us at the recent briefing here in Lansdowne House, at times they were stripped and photographed, their torturers holding their brutalised bodies up by the hair, another form of so-called degrading treatment, just like in Guantanamo, just like in Abu Ghraib, just like in Palestine, the torturer's handbook followed meticulously even to this very day. One of the most noted stories of torture endured by the hooded men was when they were hooded, they were brought from the specially designed torture chamber at Ballykelly to a helicopter and flown uh, for a prolonged period, but just several, uh, four or five feet in the air. And while hooded, they were thrown out backwards from that helicopter, thinking they were God knows high, high up. The psychology behind all of this was to, to deprive the men of their normal, everyday sensory experience of life. The boiler suit and the hood over their heads covered their naked bodies. For over, over a week, they lived in their boiler suits and performed all bodily functions. The hood was only removed during interrogations. The five techniques included prolonged periods of standing against the wall, arms and legs spread eagled, the so-called stress position, hooded day and night, deprivation of sleep by using what the men described as high pitch hissing noise and deprivation of food and drink. During the briefing in Lancaster House recently, we were told it was like the noise went in through your head and penetrated every sinew and muscle in your body. It went down into your lungs and came out through your toes. The men were repeatedly and viciously beaten about the head and had their genitals kicked and continuously threatened with death. The effect of this was prolonged pain, physical and mental exhaustion, severe anxiety, depression, hallucinations, disorientation and repeated loss of consciousness. Having listened, to the, having listened to the men's story, we can test too that not only were they subjected to torture over this period, but so too were their families. These men were taken from their homes and their people. 
their mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, wives and girlfriends, all of whom knew nothing of their whereabouts the whole duration of their torture. Families crippled with fear, unbeknownst to them where their loved ones were taken. So they went to hospitals. They even went to mortuaries. Their fathers went and pleaded with the RUC, who told them they hadn't got them. But we know they had them. They had them in Ballycally barracks. All this done at a time when sectarian killings were rife, when young men were being lifted off the streets to meet the most cruelest of ends. Now, can you only imagine the worry for their families, the torture for their families, when the very people who arrested them without trial were then telling their loved ones that they were gone, that they didn't have them? And what happened to them, ultimately, at the end of this prolonged period of torture? No wraparound care, no after services, no counselling. But in the Long Cache internment camp they went, arrest, arrested and held without trial or without charge. So the entirety and the magnitude of all these frightening ordeals continue to haunt these men to this very day. The most reasonable people, uh, to, the most reasonable people uh, know what these men experienced in a word was torture. Yet the reason why Liam uh, is with us today is because the European Court of Human Rights has decided that the men weren't in fact tortured. They are here because the court has a different threshold when defining torture, and what I have just described to the House, believe it or not, according to the court, isn't torture. However, the court readily accepts that what the men experienced was inhuman and degrading treatment, and we would all agree on that, of course. But I, like I am sure many colleagues, am baffled. Indeed, most sensible people would be baffled as to the actual legal difference between inhumane torture and degrading treatment. Uh, sorry, between torture and inhumane and degrading treatment. What is the difference? I don't believe there is any difference. Human rights organisations around the world uh, don't believe there is none. The Irish state believes there is none, and that is why it has taken uh, Britain to the European courts twice since 1971. In 71, the Irish government, on the men's behalf, took the British state to the European uh, Court of Human Rights. Sorry, the European Human Rights Commission. The Commission found the British government guilty of torturing the men unanimously. The British government appealed that decision, and in 1978, the European Court of Human Rights reversed the Commission's verdict and found the British government guilty of inhuman and degrading treatment and not torture. And so here we are today. But under international pressure, the British government announced it would never again use the five techniques on defenceless prisoners. In December 2014, the Irish government, following uh, renewed efforts by the men and their families, took, again took the British government uh, to the Court uh, of Human Rights on the basis of new facts to seek to overturn the 1978 verdict and reinstate the Commission's verdict of torture. In March of this year, the European Court upheld its uh, 1978 decision that the British government used inhuman uh, and degrading treatment and not, in fact, torture. And tonight, Cahirlach, I am asking the Shannon to support this motion, calling on the Irish Government to appeal the decision earlier this year and to continue the good work uh, the State began in 1971. And time is quickly running out to lodge this appeal. And it is a straightforward matter, and the Government should act swiftly. The men, and indeed society here in Ireland and across the world, need the Irish Government and are looking to the Irish Government to pursue justice for the men until it is ultimately achieved. Such persistence sends a very clear message to those governments who continue to use inhuman and degrading torture uh, that their actions are being scrutinised and they will be made accountable for them. Francie McGuigan put it very succinctly when at the briefing just two weeks ago he told us, Our ask is simple. The British government should wear the label of torture on the international stage because that is exactly what they were. There should be no legal or popular tolerance of torture, no matter the circumstances, and human rights courts need to be crystal clear on this fundamental issue. When the hooded men came to Lancaster House, they moved us with their story. They insisted uh, that this isn't a political issue. They stressed further, it certainly isn't a party political issue, and they told us this is an issue of human rights. Their lawyer, Dara Magan, added, the Irish state, state took this case because they knew the truth of what these men endured. Why would you set out on this legal journey to not see it through to the very end? I agree with all of those sentiments, as I have no doubt the rest of this Shannon does too. And Minister, it is important to say, because sometimes, uh, regardless of its significance, the term legacy case has almost lost its edge. It has lost its importance because there is such a litany and so many experiences from the course of the conflict. But this is not just a legacy case. 
This has lave immediate lived consequences for these men and their families. It has lave legal implications uh, for victims of torture all ar around the world, while states continue to use the verdict in relation to this case as some kind of cloak of convenience or cover for the torture that they inflict uh, on citizens, whether their own or indeed uh, from other countries. In fact, the book written by Father Fall and Monsignor Murray uh, in 1975 on the experience of the hooded men continues to sell uh, all around the world right to this day, such a sad reflection on the interest in this case and the example being looked to by victims of torture all around the world in the form of the hooded men and their campaign. So I would urge you, Minister, on behalf of the Government uh, to tell us that this appeal will be lodged and that the Irish State won't just stand for the hooded men, but will stand for victims of torture uh, all around the world and will stand, more importantly, for any further potential victims uh, of torture so that we can shine a light uh, and expose what happened uh, to the hooded men and that this state will set an example across the EU and beyond that we stand for justice and for truth. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Donila. And now I call on Senator Rose Conway Walsh to second the motion, and you have eight minutes. Go ahead. Uh, here, look, and uh, I wish to formally second the motion put forward by my colleague. Uh, we are using, I know there are very many issues that could be discussed today. There's very serious issues happening in our, uh, in our country uh, as it is. But we decided as a Sinn Féin team in the Shannad that justice for the hooded men was more important than anything else. And the reason we did is because this is a very time-limited decision, a decision that needs to be made today and needs to be followed up with a clear process after today. So we are here today to discuss torture, torture that was inflicted upon Irish citizens by the British government. And I want to pay tribute to those who have suffered this torture and who are here with us today and those who cannot be here with us. I think especially of Sean McKenna, who passed away in 1975, shortly after being examined by a doctor in Dublin who cited his mistreatment as a cause of death. The groundbreaking documentary, The Torture Files, aired on RTE1 in 2014, again focused attention on this case. I do want to commend RTE Investigations Unit and the Pat Finucane Centre who spent many months trawling through the National Archives in Kew. They discovered that as early as March 1971, RUC officers were being trained in the application of the five techniques that a facility uh, to house the process was also in the planning. It appears now that the five techniques indeed had ministerial approval and that the individual cases were settled out of court to ensure that no minister, former or present, could be charged with the conspiracy. So the Conservative government of the day authorised torture and subsequent Labour governments covered it up. The 1978 judgment, which turned torture into degrading and inhuman treatment, had implications far beyond this island. In 2003, the U.S. Attorney General quoted the 1978 ruling as justification for use of torture and interrogation methods in Iraq, claiming that it was not torture. Ireland, as a nation of people, has a reputation abroad for standing up for inhumane treatment. Of course, we would like to see our government take stronger action against those who carry out torture and early judicial murder but at least we call it for what it is. Let us not be found wanting in our own country. I am urging senators to support this motion so that the moral compass can be recalibrated. Treating individuals in a way described by my colleague, Senator O'Gonnell, uh, is torture. The torture he described, which took place in Ballykelly and elsewhere, had a devastating impact on the lives of those who suffered through it and indeed who still, still suffer today as a result of it. Its impact was felt by communities from which they came. They suffered with them. When one of their own is brutalised and tortured, the community is, is dealt a blow to its integrity. When injustice touches upon areas of human dignity, there will always be a reaction. We must ensure that this never happens again. The first step in achieving this is to define it accurately and to define it as torture. 
All forms of torture must be ended in Ireland, Palestine and beyond. I do understand that there is cross-party support uh, for this motion. Um, the appeals process must be instigated, as I said, immediately. I thank all of those who have taken an interest. I thank my own colleague, Niall O'Donnell, and I think it shows them the, the, the merit of having somebody with a perspective, a 32, well, we all have a 32 county perspective, but who lived within that community and lives within that community to be able to bring uh, the story here to Linster House. Because I think until the presentation was done here in the AV room a number of weeks ago, until we heard firsthand exactly from the men what they had suffered and indeed from their, their solicitor, I think it brought back to us. I remember as a child being told about this and being told about the hooded men. And you know, it always seems like something ab abstract and something like that couldn't really have happened, you know. And you particularly have heard about the, the helicopter and the dropping from the helicopter and all of that. And there is a certain amount of disbelief, no matter how you hear it or whatever you think there may be a bias about it. But when you hear it straight from these men in terms of the exactly what was done to them. There is no question whatsoever, but it has to be named and shamed and it has to be called torture. Because if that's not torture, I don't know what is. So I hope that this will go forward. Uh, I trust in this government around this. I trust in them that they will do the right thing. The natural next step is to appeal this. It can be appealed before the 15th of, of June. And I think and I hope that the results will be different this time around and that the men will get, the, and their families, will get the peace and the justice that they have waited decades for. Thank you, Kahirlep, and thank you, Minister.